Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here with a verse from John 20. And this is where Jesus appears to Thomas, verse 29. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Whether you're here watching online or here this morning with us, uh, may you all be blessed as we worship God together this morning. Uh, there is a few announcements. Uh, you can see the stage is being rebuilt. Uh, there's no railings anywhere, so anybody who's coming up here, please be very careful. Uh, it's a big step off each side, so don't go there. Uh, then I'm just going to read out of our bulletin. It's uh, an announcement from uh, Gate 316, and they send us this following note. It is with downright humility and appeal that I come to each of you with a begging request for the gate. Our fridges are empty and quickly, and we certainly wish to maintain strongly the balanced, nutritious meals for our homeless and poor. We are in dire need of volumes of meat, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, and dairy products, predominantly regular supplies of milk, cheeses, butter, and margarine. If you can help support us in any way for these provisions, either one time or on an ongoing regular basis, the light of hope will be maintained with Christ's bounty. So if you have donations, they can be dropped off at the gate or at Maranatha for our representative to deliver. So please keep that in mind. And then uh, a nice note from Alicia's and uh, Sports Camp, and that's the Sports Camp registration is full, but there is a waiting list, so if you want to get your name, or if you want to get your child's name, actually, on the waiting list, uh, please see Alicia. And next week is Gem Sunday, so there will be soup after church next week, so uh, bring your mug, and you can taste all the different soups that the Gems have made. So uh, keep that in mind. And now we're pleased to welcome Pastor Brenny Van Dalen to the pulpit. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be with you again, Nancy and I. Uh, we came here already last night, stayed in a hotel, but we're happy to be with you again. It's been quite a while. I think it's been 13 years already since I served you for a few months. We've been here on occasion to preach, but we're uh, happy to be back with you again this morning. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to those of you uh, watching online, and may the Lord bless us as we serve him together. Please join me in the uh, responsive call to worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of his Son, Jesus Christ, we have, be, we have been born anew into a living hope. We have been given an inheritance that will never pass away. Blessed be the glory and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's respond with the song, Goodness of God.
Congregation of Jesus Christ, it is our privilege to know that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heavens and the earth and who has recreated us in his Son, Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. When we approach God, we immediately come to the fact, as many of the Old Testament prophets did, that when we meet God, that can be a very scary situation. Because God is holy, He is all-glorious, and we are people who every day again have sinned, who every day again have fallen short of what He would expect of us. But we can come to God in a prayer of confession because our God is a loving God, and our God is a God who not only uh, uh, forgives sins, he is eager to forgive sins when we come together and repent. So let's bow together in a prayer of confession. Lord our God, we confess we do not always accept the new growth within us. We do not always remember the hope we received in the resurrection of Jesus. Let's respond together. We become too busy with our own tasks and do not bother to see if they fit into your plans for us. Amid change, we become tentative and fearful, finding it difficult to trust in your upholding presence. Forgive us for our lack of trust. We pray that the reality of the resurrection may bring us new life and meaning. We ask this in the name of our resurrected Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Paul says to us in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And that is the good news of the gospel. Well, we might ask, what do we do with that good news? We give thanks to God. And as the Heidelberg Catechism clearly makes known to us, how do you give thanks to God? By seeking to now live the new life that he calls us to live. Let me read a few verses from the book of Romans. Paul says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. We respond with the song, I Speak Jesus.
Are there any children with us this morning? If there are, do you want to come up front? Well, good morning, children. Have, has anybody ever made a promise to you? Can you think of a time when somebody made a promise to you? Have your parents ever made a promise to you? Can't think of one? Wow. What do you hope to get for your next birthday? Who's got a birthday close by? What do you hope to get for your birthday? Okay. Do your parents know that? Okay. <laughs> Did they promise that you would get it? <laughs> okay. Do you ever have any friends that made promises to you? I'm going to come and play with you tomorrow? You probably did. Did they always keep their promise? Uh, yes. Yes, always? <laughs> oh, then you got good friends. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes we make promises, but we can't keep them because we're not in control of everything. And so sometimes maybe we make a promise or your parents make a promise, we're going to take you to Disneyland or whatever else. And maybe something comes in between and they can't go and then we can be very disappointed. We can make promises and we should try to keep our promises when we make them, but we can't always keep them because we're not in control of everything. Do you know somebody who makes promises and always keeps them? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, God makes promises and he always keeps them. And that's why uh, many times uh, when we're Christians, we talk about hope. And sometimes we hope that we're going to do fun things tomorrow. We hope that we might get a new bike or we hope that we might get uh, some new thing that we've always wanted. But we never know for sure whether it's going to happen. But when God makes a promise, we have a hope, and we know that hope will always come true. Because God has... How long has God been around? Anybody know? How long Every he, single day. Every single day, that's right. More days than we could count. Because God's always been around, we say, for eternity. Okay? And so God made a promise way back in the beginning that he would send Jesus and over... Two, three thousand years later, he brought Jesus, who died on the cross for us. So God has always been with us, and so when he makes a promise, he can keep it, even if it's three thousand years later. And that's the, beautiful, that's the beautiful thing we can remember. So let's thank God for his promise. Okay, shall we pray? Thank you, Jesus, that you make promises that you always keep. And thank you that you make promises that give us hope today. And when we hope for what, that your promises will come true, we know they will because you always keep your promises. And so thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing the children's song, When Peace Like a River, I believe. I know
This morning, it's my privilege to lead us in congregational prayer. Please join me in prayer. God, thank you for spring. Thank you for the rain that is soaked into your earth. Thank you for the warmth of the sun. Thank you that together it will bring on growth, then food, flowers, leaves on the trees, cleaning the air that we breathe. What an amazing place. Thank you, God. God, as we have just weeks ago celebrated Easter, we have to thank you once again for your son's sacrifice for us, that through his resurrection we are saved. You are amazing God. Thank you. God, we pray for comfort for the family of Peter Groen, brother to Rose Rusticus. Please give them peace as they mourn the loss of a loved one. God, please pour out your love on all those who are grieving. Let them feel your presence and know you are there. Please help them through their sadness. Thank you, God. God, we pray for Grace Des Moines. Please give her healing and strength following her cancer treatments. God, please give Grace and Leo whatever they may need. Thank you, God. God, we pray for Catherine Hall, for Mitchell, and for Catherine's parents, Nick and Mary. God, please be with the surgeons, nurses, and caregivers as Catherine undergoes her leg amputation. Please give her healing and restore her health that she may return to an active lifestyle. Thank you, God. God, there are many in our church family experiencing health struggles. God, please bring healing to those in need. We pray for Gladys Dykstra, for Jerry Hellinga, for Betty Banstra, for Alice Wasalius. God, we pray for Nathan Terry and Andy and Henny Strickwerda. We pray for Phil and Rita Van Hardingsvelt for Corey Van Dyke, for Harry Vanderbilt, and for Ray and Corey Schoonhoven. God, there are others we don't know about, but you do. Please be with them. Thank you, God. God, we pray for the children in our church family. Please keep them healthy and safe. We pray for their parents. God, help them and us teach their children about you that they will know your love for them. God, we pray for the young adults as they mature in their faith and become more involved in the life of this church. God, show them their gifts as they become the future leaders. God, please keep our church family, young and old, strong and connected to you. Thank you, God. God, please open our hearts that we can better serve those less fortunate, from the poor and the homeless, to refugees and those suffering oppressions under authoritarian governments. God, there are so many in your world falling through the cracks. Help us to not become immune to what is going on around us and give us the willingness to help. Thank you for all you have given us. God, we pray all this to you through your son, Jesus. Thank you for always listening. Amen. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> For the scripture reading this morning, I've chosen uh, the passage from Romans 8. I'll read the verses 18 through 39. Romans 8, 18 through In this passage, Paul is uh, talking about hope, and I'm going to focus on that word hope in the, te in the uh, text, verse 24 and 25. Uh, but it's interesting that Paul talks about this hope in a pas passage that also talks about all kinds of suffering, all kinds of difficulty, all kinds of issues that we face here today, which seem to uh, speak and contradict the fact that Christ has uh, conquered all things. So I begin reading at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. 
We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have had the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no, no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through word wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. <clears throat> For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our text is taken from verses 24 and 25, a text that focuses on hope. In fact, the word hope is mentioned five different times. We find this verse hope in our text. In fact, uh, Paul mentions the word hope quite often, uh, quite often in this chapter. Now, when we talk about hope, of course, as I mentioned to the children, we can hope for a lot of things. We can hope for things in life. We can hope for beautiful vacations. We can hope that we're going to get the gift we've always uh, treasured getting. We can hope a whole lot of different things. We hope for good health. We hope that we'll be able to take that beautiful vacation in a few weeks or whatever else it may be. We have many hopes. But of course, as we all know, the hopes that we have, we never know for sure. We never know whether it's going to be realized. We hope it will be, but we really don't know. Now, some uh, psychologists will tell you, well, if you really have a positive outlook, and if you really look forward to the things that you're hoping for, then you can help them come about. Well, there may be some truth to that. But even then, I think we would have to admit that we are never totally sure of what we hope for. At least not with the way, in the sense that we normally use hope. Because, of course, what does hope entail? Hope is looking forward to something that you don't have yet. And Paul says that in our text. You don't hope for what you already have. You don't hope for what you can already see. You hope for something that is not yet there. Well, in our text, we find this word hope. It's mentioned five times in just these two verses, and Paul mentions it a few more times in the passage. Is there something unique 
about what Paul describes here as hope? Or is it just more positive talk about hope, hoping it will happen, but with no guarantees? Well, think of it. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. What kind of songs did you sing at Easter? I don't know what kind of songs you sung, but I imagine you sang at least one or two songs that had the word hallelujah in them because they were songs of victory. They were songs that said Christ has accomplished all. Christ has won all. We are the we of the victory. We've made it. Well, have we fully made it? As I mentioned that Paul in this very passage talks about all kinds of trouble that we can run into, talks about all kinds of issues that we face. Have we fully made it? Are we fully made new? I think many of us, as we've already heard in the prayer that Ed prayed, many of us are struggling with one condition or another. Many of us are struggling with one kind of disease or another. Have we made it? Have we gained the victory? Is everything made new? Obviously not. Well, then why do we sing songs as though the victory has totally been made? Why do we sing songs that celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and now everything has been accomplished? When we know that not quite everything has been. I think of a hockey game. If you watch a hockey game and you're watching uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs play and, uh, and uh, you're hoping that they win the game, but maybe they're losing two or uh, three to one or two to one or whatever, you may hope that they will win, but do you celebrate the victory before the game's, game's over? Not really. Unless, of course, you're watching a replay. If you're watching a replay of the game and you already know the outcome and you already know that the, uh, that the Maple Leafs are going to win the game, then you can celebrate the game even while you're watching the replay, even if they're still losing two to one or three to one, because you know the outcome. Well, in a sense, that's what we have with the hope of which Paul speaks. Not everything has been completed. In fact, in this very passage, Paul says uh, that the creation is not perfect yet, and we know that. We have hurricanes, we have tornadoes, we have torrential rainstorms, we see massive flooding throughout the world. The creation, Paul says, is still groaning, waiting for the sons of man to be revealed. In other words, waiting for humanity to be totally restored, and then the creation is going to be restored with it. But why are we celebrating the victory already before everything has been completed. Because Paul speaks of a different hope. If everything was already accomplished, says Paul, you wouldn't need to speak about hope. You'd speak about fact. You'd speak about the reality that's already here. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. And that is why Paul speaks of hope in our text. But this hope is different from all the other hopes that I mentioned. This hope is based on the promises of God. And that makes it totally different. Some of it we already have today. Why do we celebrate Easter? Why do we celebrate the victory? Because already in the resurrection of Jesus, we have seen an accomplishment by God and we have seen a promise of God that he would raise, he, uh, Jesus would su first suffer on the cross, and then he would die, and then he would be raised from the dead. Well, how many people have you seen raised from the dead? That's a power we simply don't have. Yes, once in a while we read of those people that have gone through a death experience, and somehow they're brought back. But when you think of Lazarus, Four days in the grave in hot weather, but he was restored. And then Jesus, who died on the cross, went into the grave, and on the third day he was raised to life. 
That was the promise of God. And that is a promise, well, we, we could promise it, but it would never come true. So God has already shown us that he has the victory over death. But we still live in this time when we are waiting for a complete restoration of all things. We might look at it this way. Sometimes I look at the Christian life as being three things. First of all, salvation. And that we have already experienced. We have already been justified before God. If you come to Jesus in faith, if you come to Jesus in repentance, then God promises you that he will forgive you and you are fully justified. God looks upon you as though you had never sinned. And that's already a great thing. And we have that already today. But we also realize we're not fully there yet. God looks at us as though we had never sinned. But we all know that we still do sin. And in fact, Paul says even the Spirit has to help us praying because we don't know how to pray properly. And so the Spirit helps us in our weakness. There's a kid's song who kind of describe, that kind of describes the situation. We are kids still under construction. And of course, you don't have to be kids. We have adults. We are still under construction. God is not done with me yet. We may have growing faith, but we're not there yet. But we do have a down payment. And that down payment is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So salvation's already here. Sanctification, that's what we're all going through today. If you are a Christian, if you have given your heart to God, then you presently are being sanctified. What, what does that mean? It means God is going to, uh, through the Holy Spirit, make you more and more holy, make you more and more the person that he wants you to be. Now, I realize that uh, sometimes we, we, we fall back a few steps and we think, am I really making any progress in my Christian life? But the Holy Spirit, if we are open to him, he will gradually move us to a greater and greater commitment to God and a commitment to love each other. Sanctification is what we might call being under construction. And then, of course, glorification. That's something we're looking forward to in the future. And that's really what Paul talks about when he talks about the hope here. One day we're going to recognize glory. One day we're going to recognize everything brought to full perfection. But a lot of what will be accomplished is not yet seen. And that is why Paul uses the word hope. We hope for what we do not yet see. We hope for what has not yet been accomplished. And he points out that even the creation is still groaning, awaiting that renewal. We read in Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground because of you. That's what sin did. Sin not only destroyed the heart of man, sin brought all kinds of negative consequences on the creation. Pollution, destruction, storms, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, you name it. And look at Paul himself. Did Paul experience a life of glory? Did Paul experience a life of total renewal? Did Paul experience a life of total joy, total happiness, no more problems? Well, I think you know that's not the case. In fact, if you read the New Testament, read particularly 2 Corinthians, you will find that Paul has probably experienced more trial, more suffering, more difficulty than all of us. He'd been in prison for the gospel. He's been flogged severely. He's been last 40 times, five times over. He's been beaten with rods. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. He was shipwrecked three times. He's in danger from rivers, he says, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen and on. So Paul, too, realized that not everything has yet been accomplished. Christ has started. The victory has begun. 
In a sense, you might say, the resurrection of Jesus is like D-Day in the Second World War. Some of you that remember the history of the Second World War, you will remember that a year before the war ended, they had what they called D-Day, when all the forces of the Allies got together and they made a, a major, major campaign against the Germans. And most people on D-Day said, this is the end. We're going to make it. We're going to defeat them. But it took another year before they did. We as God's people still suffer physically in many ways. In the prayer that I had prayed, we recognize all the trials that we still face in this world. Disease, cancer, strokes, heart issues, broken bones, emotional trauma, depression, anxiety, and the list can go on and on. Even one of the hymns we sing, the hymn Abide With Me, has a phrase that says, change and decay in all around I see. Then you might ask the question, why then do we talk about that glorious victory? Because of hope. But is Paul just being delusional here when you look at all the trouble that he himself faced? No, Paul is a child of the resurrected Jesus. And if you are a child of Jesus, then the hope that you have is totally different from the hopes we often talk about. Many of the hopes we may have, many of the aspirations we may have in life do not come to fruition. And interestingly, even when you meet a person who hoped for the right school to go to, who hoped for getting the right job, who hoped for getting the right toys that he always wanted, and maybe in the end he gets them all. And then you talk to him or her and you find out they still don't feel fulfilled, even though all the hopes that they had were realized. Because many of the hopes that we have can be very selfish, very self-centered. And even if we get them, it doesn't provide the fulfillment that we hoped they would. Paul talks about a totally different hope. A hope that God mentioned at the very beginning. And God made promises in the Old Testament that we see fulfilled. I think of Abraham. Can you imagine God telling Abraham, who was... Uh, uh, 90 plus years old, and Sarah, who was roughly the same age, you're going to have a child. God had promised that child for who knows how long. And finally, here they are in their 90s. And God says, Abraham, you're going to get a child. Well, you know what Abraham did? Well, if, if, if maybe I got to help God realize the promises. And so, of course, they had, uh, they had a child through one of his uh, maidservants, uh, Ishmael. God said, no, no, your wife Sarah is going to have a child. Well, of course, we would today say maybe he did at that time. Well, Sarah, Sarah laughed. Sarah said, yeah, right, tell me another sick joke. But, of course, Sarah received Isaac, which means laughter. She saw her promise of God realized against all uh, human capability. In Isaiah 53, the chapter of the suffering servant Isaiah says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Notice that Isaiah speaks of this as though it has already happened. But he made this promise over 400 years before Jesus actually lived in this earth and before he went to the cross and rose. The prophets would often speak of prophecy as though it has already happened. It's in the future, but they talk about it as though it has already happened because the promises of God and the hope of God are as good as fact. Jeremiah 31 talks about the fact that I will make a new covenant, and that new covenant again, four or five hundred years later, was fulfilled in the cross and the resurrection. And we are members of the new covenant in Christ. 
And remember the promise that God made at the very beginning of history. Adam fell, Adam and Eve fell, and already in Genesis 3.15, Paul says, uh, God says, I am going to stop this destruction, and I am going to again bring you back to me. And he, he says that beautiful text where he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And many thousands of years later, God kept that promise in Jesus. And it's good for us to think of the fact, who on earth can make a promise that you're going to try and fulfill 2,000 years later? Nobody could do that, of course. We only live 100 years. Most of us don't even make that. God is eternal. And that is why God can make a promise. And he'll cause its fulfillment hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years later. We see many consequences of the resurrection today, and yet there are many things that we still hope for. And our hope is that they will, that they will be realized. But with God's promise, our hope is as good as fact. And that's why we sang all the celebration songs at Easter. And we sing those celebration songs quite often every Sunday. Because really every Sunday is a, res is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus and all the consequences that it has brought and will continue to bring. And so we, we have songs that have these phrases in them. Christ's redeeming work is done. Now is the triumph of our King. The strife is o'er, the battle done. Is the strife really over? Is the battle done? We know it's not. But we sing songs as though it is because the hope of God is sure. The hope of God is as good as fact. Now someone might respond, aren't you counting your chickens before they're hatched? And the answer is, yes, that's exactly as Christians, what we are doing. But we do that only because our hope in Christ is as good as fact. And note that Paul says, even the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. <clears throat> and you and I today still groan inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons and daughters. Well, yes, we have already been adopted. That's already fact. But the adoption's not totally complete because not everything has been brought to its completion. And so we even hope yet for that. Well, the interesting thing is, sometimes we have to go through suffering. But that often le leads us to turn to that hope more intensely than before. I found that sometimes my, my uh, greatest times of growth have been after a time of crisis. And I've noticed quite often uh, when I met patients in the hospital, sometimes you'll have uh, members in your church, uh, you know there's a commitment inside, but they have a difficult they have difficulty expressing that commitment. They have difficulty expressing their spiritual position with God. And then I'll meet them in the hospital, and they're in crisis. And sometimes some of the most beautiful spiritual discussions I've had with Christian people are when they're in the hospital, when they're uh, facing all kinds of trial with wh whatever kind of disease it is. And then they're reaching out for God even in a more confirmed way than they might have before. And so, yes, even in our age, when things are not yet fully complete, sometimes God uses even suffering to draw us closer to him because suffering reminds us, you are not in control. So look to someone who is. Yes, there are times when many of the hopes that we have are dashed. But the hope that you have in Christ will never be dashed because it is the promise 
from the eternal God, the one who has already revealed to you that he has power even over death. So the promise of God, the hope that we have in Christ, is as good as fact. So what does this hope mean for our lives today? Well, let me quote Shepard, a professor from Tyndale College. Well, he's retired now. It means that despite life's contradictions, we are to join the prophets and apostles in announcing that day above all days when the world's suffering people neither hunger nor thirst anymore, when nation no longer lifts up sword against nation, when God wipes away every tear from every eye. Despite the fact that many of our experiences today contradict that glory of which the gospel speaks, we know that it is as good as fact. God has begun that good work in us today if we have accepted his promise by faith. The Spirit today is already our down payment. Paul wrote to the Philippians, I am sure that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus. God hasn't finished with me or you yet. And sometimes in my darkest day, I might be tempted to think that, well, maybe this isn't all true. And of course, Satan will try to plant that in your mind, especially during times of trial. But the Holy Spirit is your guarantee that your sins have been forgiven and that your renewal will be completed. So believe and put your hope in Christ. And this hope is assured, even if sometimes today it seems that conditions contradict it. Paul says again in Corinthians 15, that great resurrection chapter, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In this hope, we work in obedience to Christ, even when it seems that that obedience might be pointless. It reminds me of a child that was walking along the beach, and he was seeing these starfish, and he would grab a starfish, and he'd whip it back in the ocean. And another man came by and said, what are you doing, boy? He says, I'm throwing the starfish back in the water. He said, there are thousands of starfish on the beach. What difference does it make if you throw one or two back in the water? Well, he says, it makes a difference to that one. And sometimes as we are called to that new obedience in the promises of God, we might wonder, does obedience to God really make a difference? Ministering to the needy. Sometimes that appears to be nothing but a revolving door. Exercising the principles of the new life. It often can appear pointless, especially in a broken and groaning world. For many years, I, uh, I uh, did, a, as a volunteer, I, did, I led a spirituality group in South Lake Hospital in Newmarket. And I'd come in there, and interestingly, many of them, of course, it was a, it, they were people that were struggling with depression, and so uh, uh, they'd be in there. Interestingly, when I mentioned the word hope, their eyes would suddenly perk up, because often, Many of people struggling with very chronic and critical depression, their hope is gone. They don't see any hope. They don't see any meaning in life anymore. And you mention the word hope, and it's like, you mean there is such a thing yet? But I had other times I'd walk into that session, and, uh, and, and I'd try to get a spiritual discussion going. And for about half an hour, 45 minutes, we'd talk about the birds and the bees and everything else, but you couldn't get anything really going. And then I'd walk out and I'd, uh, I'd say to Nancy, well, that was a waste of time, uh, an hour today. And then two or three weeks later, I'd be sitting in the coffee shop in the hospital and some lady would come up to me and say, oh, aren't you the guy that does a spiritual group thing upstairs? Yeah, I am. 
She said, you mentioned something in that group. She says, I'll never forget. It's what I had to hear. And she mentioned to me what it was, and I thought, did I say that? Well, the fact is, the Holy Spirit made sure she heard it. I don't know whether I said it or not. And I've had the same thing sometimes in preaching. People will approach me after a sermon, and they'll say, thank you, Pastor, for saying that. I really needed to hear that. And then they'll describe the phrase, and sometimes they'll say, did I say that? I don't remember saying it. Well, the Holy Spirit often works in ways even apart from us. And sometimes maybe he turns my words around to words that people need to hear instead of the words that I spoke. And that's the beauty of creation. That's the beauty of what God does through his work. And so never think that when you're seeking to serve the Lord or when you're obeying the Lord, that it is futile. It never is, even if at the, at the time it seems that way. And there are times, the ones I mentioned, when I see afterwards, okay, there was a purpose for being there. There may be many times when you serve God, you won't find out what the results really are. But just accept the promise of God. He's working through obedience, and he will continue. Shepherd, I quote Shepherd again, Hope from a biblical perspective is a future certainty grounded in a present reality. The present reality is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's accomplished. We know it. And the way that we can experience him already today. And the future certainly is a new heaven and a new earth. I reminded of those beautiful words from Revelation where we are told that the day is coming when there will be no more crying, no more pain. All the old order of things has passed away. I am making everything new. And that is why Paul mentioned in Corinthians 15. Now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. Faith that you believe and trust what God has promised Hope that you have a hope that is as good as fact. And love that you now seek to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbors yourself and to begin that new way of living already today. Faith, hope, and love. They all belong together. And that's why today we are called to live a life of love because we can be a foreshadowing of what is to come. God's way is the right way. God's promise is guaranteed. I sometimes hear advertisements on TV that said this and that, and then they'll say, guaranteed. But you and I know from experience that guarantee often doesn't mean much. God's guarantee is there. He's the God of eternity. He's the God who made, who's made promises they fulfill sometimes maybe a lot further away than we would like, but he fulfills every promise. And that is why we can celebrate the completion already. And that is why we can celebrate hymns of victory already today, because we know our hope is sure. Praise him for it. Amen. <clears throat> Let's bow together in prayer. Lord God, when we stop to think about what you have done, that you have gained the victory over death, that you have promised that we too will gain the victory, that we too will be made totally new, and that one day we will live in a new heaven and a new earth. And Lord, when we look at all the uh, complications in our world today, all the struggles, all the wars, all the conflict, all the destruction, we sometimes wonder, is anything going to come of this? But then we thank you for your promise. We thank you that the day is coming when all things will be made new. Yes, Lord, we have many questions, but may these questions never override our faith and trust that you never break a promise, that you have begun our, that you have begun our, our newness, that you have begun our new lives, 
and that we know that they will be fully completed and that even that last enemy death will be conquered and has become only for us a gateway into full glory. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done, for what you continue doing, and for what you will accomplish in the end. May we always trust you. May we always praise you. And even in our darkest moments, may we remember that the victory is already ours because of the hope that you have given us. We pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond with a song, Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. <clears throat>
I just want to say, I just love the smell of the fresh cut wood. It brings me back to my childhood. <laughs> um, where now is the time that we get to have the privilege to give back to our Lord through our monetary gratitude and offerings. And we have two collections collected at the same time. The first is towards our operating budget, and the second special cause is for our global resident missionaries, Kim and Steve Holtrop in Nicaragua. I love saying all these words. In, and Mikali Wamba in Eastern Africa. Um, I encourage you to check out uh, Resident Global Missions uh, website to learn more about what they're doing. It's just quite amazing what they're, they're doing. Um, each year we now pledge money towards their, their fundraising. And we have pledged $3,000 this year for each of them. And they receive 10% of their budget, their huge budget, uh, from residents, and the rest they must fundraise. So we decided to do, do more collections for the missionaries each year. And our hope is that we can donate 4000 to each person, each um, set of missionaries. So let us come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today and the privilege to worship you. And as we offer our offerings to you and the uh, global missionaries, thank you for these people who have dedicated their lives to the service of your, their, your work. Bless them in all that they do. In your name we pray. Amen.
Shall we stand if you are able for the benediction? Receive the blessing of God and go home, go home in his joy. May now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We conclude with the doxology because of you. Thank you.